Thank you, Uli, for inviting me. Um, we met a long time ago. She was a professor in, in the United States a long time ago, if I remember correctly. And so we run into each other there and interested in similar things. So it's nice to um, spend a few days with you and um, hear about all the great projects in, in, in TACO. I think it's a really exciting center. It's, um, you know, I think if you, the world looks at where oxide surface science is advancing, this, is, this has to be the place. So congratulations to all of you. Um, just an interesting, from after um, Alberto read my uh, bio, I remembered there's a real coincidence here because of the invited speakers. Paul and I were at the University of Pennsylvania at exactly the same time in graduate school. And he, I was on the third floor of the building. He was on the fourth floor of the building. And we didn't know each other, but we were there. <laughs> and it's just, I guess, the difference between being in physics and being in material science. Um, anyway, so I'm going to talk about um, strontium titanate surfaces, but in a very different way than all the elegant work that's going on here. I'm going to, I'm going to zoom back in the resolution a little bit and look at um, larger things. And it, as you can see from the picture on the board, one idea I'd like to get across is that the shape of the of a particle really matters in, in its catalysis, and I'll explain how that works. I'm going to go. Um, I'm going to go over this quickly because I know you have projects, and in, in that there are PIs in this uh, group who are working on photocatalysis. So I, I think everybody here knows this. I, the only thing I'm going to say is that there's um, the way I look at this world is there's sort of two ways to advance. There's one would be for a photoelectrochemical cell and which is, is a very elegant way to do it. And the, then there's a sort of cheap and dirty way to do it, which is to use single particles. And the particles themselves are just sort of short-circuited photochemical cells. Um, you put a co-catalyst on that looks like the other, ele the, um, other electrode. And the, uh, I've sort of decided to go down this particle path because if any kind of reasonable cost estimate of if you were gonna actually make hydrogen, um, it seems like the a, a system of photoelectrochemical cells has a lot of engineering um, expenses and difficulties associated with it, of sealing um, cells and, and having um, fluids for, flow through them, whereas the particle route is, is much less expensive. It really involves plastic bags filled with your catalyst and water lying in the sun somewhere, and then having a piping system to, to extract gas. So we're going down this route, but um, I just like to point out there's huge challenges in this, and this is why it hasn't, the problem isn't really um, solved yet. But, the, you know, to do water splitting, what you need to do is uh, you need to have an oxidation and a reduction reaction. So what we're asking is for one particle, do two chemically opposite things, which is hard to do. Now, the three-way catalyst in your, in your car works this way, so it's not impossible. Um, you know, one, one the solution people have tried is that um, if you can imagine that you have a particle with different crystallographic surfaces and some are more cathodic and more anodic, then you could you could imagine doing this. Um, we would like to separate the two half reactions because although I drew them very simply here, um, they do not just go from uh, water to O2. There's there's a set of intermediates in there. And they are um, likely, before they get to O2, to recombine and, um, and do nothing. So uh, having them spatially separated turns out to be important. Um, and then there's a number of other materials criteria. One that's um, not um, considered enough is this last one, stability. You could make the best photocatalyst in the world, but if it dissolves after a week, it's, it's of no use to anybody. Okay, so with that, um, the way I'm going to structure this talk is I'm going to spend um, a bit of time talking about the material that um, what we learned about the material over the years and how we do our experiments. Um, and this is this is a fully experimental talk um, in contrast to what we've seen before. And then I'll talk about some newer things um, at, at the in the second part. But I just want to begin with someone else's work. This is the work from Doman's group in Japan, and it's. I think I find it really inspiring. This paper came out about four years ago. And I'll, I'll, you know, I realize you can't read the absence. This is the quantum efficiency of water splitting. Um, and this is the wavelength of light. But in UV light, this is 100% near within experimental error of 100% efficiency. 
even if it's only 95%, who cares? I mean, we're, we're not going to do any better than this. So this is uh, quite amazing. The only problem is this is at about 365 nanometers. And you probably know there's not a lot of 365 nanometer light that makes it to the Earth's surface from the sun. So um, the overall efficiency is not that great. Um, it's on the order of 2% in the best case of, of total sunlight. So, but nevertheless, that this can be done is, um, is amazing. And I won't go into all the way they've engineered this particle to do it, but um, this, is, this is the kind of thing we look at and say, okay, how can, we, how can we learn better about the structure property relations of this material? So one of the experiments I'm gonna do is very simple. It's, um, we've been doing this for a long time, but it's, it's, it's very, also very useful. And that is the idea that we just use um, what I call marker reactions. And so we can um, put our catalyst in a, say, silver bearing solution, shine light on it, um, and silver will reduce on the surface where electrons are available. And so if you have a, um, a surface like this, this is a barium titanate surface before a reaction, this is after the reaction, all this white contrast is where silver has collected and we can identify that. So, uh, so it's just a very quick, convenient way of doing this. Now, if you look at strontium titanate, um, what we, um, we, this is a polycrystal surface and you can see three grains here. These are, this was heated at high temperature. The surface is completely faceted, and you can see that there appears to be only a few flat surfaces on here. So what, what we do is we then use um, electron backscatter diffraction to get the orientations of these three grains. In fact, I get the orientations of 100 grains, but um, there's three in this picture. And then you can go in with an AFM, and then you can measure the actual surface topography. And from that, extract the vectors on the, that are normal to the surface. And then knowing the crystal orientations, you transform them back into the crystal frame. And then you find out that basically, after looking at 350 different facets on, on, on 200 different grains, you find out that they're all clustered. All these surfaces are basically um, 100 or 110. So those are the only parts of the look shape that matter. The straight points here, there, there's uncertainties in, in measurement of these angles. And, and, but there's huge cluster of points at these, at these within the sort of a five degree window of our, our uncertainties. So with that, then we can you know, do experiments like um, this, this is one of these fasted surfaces after a silver reduction reaction. And you can see that on, this is a corrugated surface. Um, and you can see that the silver only clusters on one of the two um, types of facets. Um, so this is this is a, a photocathodic surface. The other surface is not. It does not like to reduce things. And if you, I just to summarize a bunch of um, experiments and or this, it's not that these are coming out very bright. But um, if we um, if we identify the, the photocathodic surfaces, they're always this one zero zero. And if we identify the, we can also run oxidation reactions on here. So this is, this is the oxidation of manganese. Um, and you can see it only collects on certain surfaces. It's, it's free, it's not on the other surfaces. And again, if we index all those surfaces, the, the anodic surface is on 110. So this is a, a really nice system to, to work with in that way. And those are bulk samples. I just want to point out the same thing happens with, with small little tiny crystals where the, um, the, the, if you have, these are just small crystals of strontium titanate made and silver only collects on on these one zero zero surfaces. So the, it, it's not a problem. We'll just, you know. Um, okay, so why do we think this is true? Um, so we, we have these two, two opposite surfaces, one's cathodic, one's zenotic. And the, uh, uh, in the standard in photochemistry is people show a diagram like this, they call it the band structure. Of course, it's really just an energy level diagram. There's no bands there. Um, but I think this, you can't get any kind of information about this um, anisotropy from, from an energy level diagram like that. But if I take a, a band structure from the literature for strontium titanate, and what I've done is this red box, that's the energy of my life. So I can't excite any transitions that are bigger than that box. And if you look where that box fits, it fits. Um, it can only excite transitions at the gamma point 
and extending into the one zero zero direction. And so the light I'm using will only excite um, electrons and holes with wave factors in the one zero zero direction. And I'm finding all of my, um, at least electrons there. So that, that kind of makes sense. Now, um, what about these anonic surfaces? Well, those are out here at this M point in the zone. And I don't have enough light to excite those electrons, those holes. Um, but what must happen is the holes that are being excited at the here, notice that the height of the valence band here is greater than all these other points. So the holes should collect there if they can migrate there somewhere. So that's, so that's you take that for what it's worth. It's a hand waving argument. It'd be nice for um, some theorists to work out um, some of these things in more detail. But it seems like the holes migrate to these surfaces because that's the highest point of the valence band, and the electrons are most easily created in, in going in that direction. Another important parameter is the pH in which you do the reaction. And so these are some kind of model experiments where we've taken a strontium titanate. 100 zero, zero surface. surface. These are just These the, are facets the facets before the reaction. reaction. Well, there's steps yeah. on the surface. It's it's you can buy these crystals there within one or two degrees, and and you get these kinds of steps. And then we and then we, we run these same silver reactions, reaction, but we do it in different pHs. And what we find is that the maximum reactivity ends up being right around neutral pH, about six. And um, we have this effect where if it's um, too acidic. You, you don't get very high reactivity. If it's too basic, you also don't get very high reactivity. I'm not gonna, I have other orientations. I'm not gonna um, belabor the point. I'm gonna get to the message here. And that is that if you, um, what we believe is happening is that uh, the, or what we know, what we know to be true, I should say, is that when you change the pH, it's like setting the potential on the surface. So it's almost like we have this little knob and we can turn up the potential or down the potential because of the absorption of, of um, hydrogen or, or um, hydroxyl to the surface. And that affects the band bending on the surface. And the more hydroxyls we absorb on the, absorb on the surface in a very basic environment, that bends the bands up. That, that makes it harder for the electrons to get to the surface, but it makes it easier for the holes to get to the surface. And so what we believe is it's a very um, acidic environment. It's, it, you can bring electrons to the surface very easily, but it's hard to get the holes there. Um, as we bend it up, it diminishes the electrons a little bit, but it brings up the holes and you get a maximum at the point where both of these things can come to the surface and execute the reaction. You shut off one and the whole thing shuts off. So that's that's what we believe is happening, and again, it just you can again, see that like you can see that like this is just for the um, cathodic the, part of the reaction. Of the you know, the, the one zero one one zero just is, is not good under any circumstances, and the one 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 is only good in these acidic environments, and we think that has to do with the surface charge on that particular surface. But that's a bit of a detail. Now, to to show that we actually know something, you have to make hydrogen and. For those, I don't know, are people, is anybody in this group involved in actually doing experiments on catalysts and making hydrogen? So, catalyst people make both an exothermal or anything. Or anything. Yeah. I mean, methanol steam ready for you, and you are also performing reactions to make hydrogen. Yeah. And, and you, you collect the gases and put them through a GC. And, yeah. And so, to, to, for these water splitting reactions, it was it would take us about a day to, to make. You know, a student would come in, set up the reactor, you shine light, you let it run, you have to ex you know, extract the gas, put it through a GC, and then for a few hours, then you have to clean the whole thing up. And it would, you know, basically take one one person, one one instrument, about a day to measure a catalyst. And, it was kind of that's it was, kind of, it was that's very frustrating uh, to do that. So, but my this was developed with my colleague in chemistry, Stefan Barnhart, and I apologize, you can't see too well here. But um, what we do is there's a hundred individual vials here, um, little glass shell vials that we can put catalysts in, and um, they're all separate, so we can have different pHs, different catalysts, whatever we need. And we have this instrument. Oh, instrument. It's a, a setup. Where so we can shine light shine up light through the bottom of these, the of these of these vials, and then on and top then of this, we put this, a hydrogen sensitive, sensitive film. film. This is a material that turns black when it's exposed to hydrogen, and we we um, calibrate that by putting known amounts of hydrogen in and seeing how how dark it gets. 
So we develop a calibration curve. And then all we do is shine light on our catalyst and we take pictures up here every, every couple minutes. We turn the UV light off, we take pictures and we just keep going. And so after um, this ran for, it looks like 12 hours, um, what this line is here is this is the, the color or the amount of hydrogen calibrated based on the color um, every six minutes during this experiment. And what happens is nothing happens at the beginning because you have to fill this void. Um, you have to put some hydrogen in there, get it to the detectability level. And then after you, you start building up hydrogen, it actually builds up pressure in the cell and it, it pushes back against the reaction. And so we, we have a model for that, but we can then fit this and get a, a rate of hydrogen production. I don't know if you, what you can't probably see is that some of these after the experiment got very dark and others didn't get dark at all. So those are, are uh, not good catalysts and the others are. And every new method has, has advantages and is where it should hopefully has advantages, but it also has disadvantages. And I'll say the advantages here is in one day, well, let's just say two days, a student can set up and run this experiment and characterize 100 catalysts. The reason I say it takes two days is because you kind of have to, you have to, someone has to physically put the catalyst in 100 little files. So you have to mass out these milligram quantities. So it, that takes a lot, that takes the, that's the hardest part of this. But in two days, you can do this. And the other advantage is the, uh, we're, we're not, we can really assess our reliability because we can put five of the same catalyst in because we have a hundred of these wells. Um, we can also, we, we have a standard, we, we put five standards in every run. So we take P25, platinized P25, which is kind of the photochemical standard, and we put that in every run. And so we can benchmark from run to run if something went wrong or, or how to calibrate things. And we can get uncertainties on our results. So that's, that's cool for me. Um, so um, what kind of experiments can we do? Well, we can, we can do these experiments to say test particle shapes. And so we can hydrothermally make particles with different shapes. Um, again, these, it's kind of hard to see these, but these are representations of these nice polygonal facet particles. So we can make them completely bound by one zero zeros. These are little cubes, or we can, we can bevel the edges and get the one one zeros. And this is just by using um, surfactants during the synthesis. And I don't expect you to be able to read this, but this is just kind of the way that data comes out of the machine is that we have every one of these curves is a little, is, is one of the catalysts. And um, in this case, we changed the pH from two to 12. Um, we have a row over here where we, we did a little trick. You put um, a, a, a cheap way to make hydrogen is you put methanol in, which is a sacrificial um, oxidant. It's a lot easier to oxidize than water. And so if you want to see how good your catalyst is, um, you, you can do that too. Um, the one thing I forgot to say on the, on the initial slide about this is another disadvantage is this is fairly crude. It's not very sensitive. So if you have bad catalysts, you just get a zero result. So that's a prop that would be a problem if you're studying not very good catalysts, but I decided we're gonna study good catalysts. So that's all right. <laughs> So you get um, results like this of, of many different parameters. Again, I know I just put this up here uh, just to show off maybe, um, but we use different doping concentrations. These catalysts get very good when you add a little, you have to add a little bit of aluminum to, to compensate donors. Um, and this is just color coded where the red are, are, the, are the very good ones. What we find uh, are the particles with the right balance of these two facets, what's the best because same principle, you have to do both sides of the reaction at the same time. And the, um, it turns out that um, we tried five different concentrations of aluminum, 1% is, um, yields the most hydrogen, and the, um, and the neutral pH is about the best. And just to, just to show you that this is not all noise, you know, because there is, um, this is not the most precise way to do it, I, I'll be the first to admit that, but these are just four different shapes. You see, for every one, the one percent aluminum is at the top, and the five percent aluminum is at the bottom. So it's very systematic. And again, they all have the trend where at very acidic pHs, you have very poor reactivity. When you get up around neutral, it's it maximizes and it's, it's more or less constant after that. And that's and with all the, with all of them. So it gives you a feel that this is not um, 
it, it's not some random thing we're measuring. These are these are very systematic. And then the last thing is I'll say when we put in um, we put some methanol in, we use that trick to make it easier, and we generate a ton of hydrogen in this case. Um, we get exactly the same trends. So no, nothing has changed, except in this case, when you put the methanol in, you aren't really uh, making hydrogen. You're, you're making CO2. Um, so, um, okay, so how do we interpret this? Um, and this just comes back to this, this little picture I had before. The idea is if you can only, um, if you only have cathodic surfaces, you can only reduce things that will, it's not good for water splitting. No matter how good of a cathode you have, it's just, you can't split the water unless you have a good anode too. And so you have to balance these two, and it's not just a simple um, balance because of areas. You, you might think, well, I need half air of each area, but the oxidation reaction is harder than the reduction reaction. So you actually need more of the oxidizing surface, the um, anodic surface to, to balance the reaction. And somewhere in here um, that these particles were at about 75% anodic surfaces are the best of, of these um, material, uh, the best um, particle shape. Another, um, just an interesting thing I want to point out because it goes kind of against conventional wisdom is particle size is not what everybody, it's not what everybody thinks it is. The you know thing you might have learned in undergraduate chemistry is that surface area um, is good for heterogeneous reactions. And that's obviously that's true. But in this case, we actually get more hydrogen from bigger particles. And so we have less um, surface area really in our, um, in our material. And we've, we've, these rates are now um, normalized by the surface area. And these are per surface area, these are much more reactive to bigger particles. And the reason for this has to do with light harvesting. Um, the, you, need a, you need a bigger particle to absorb the light and transfer the, the um, carriers to the surface. I'm going to skip some of this stuff about these th slides about polarization. I don't think they're, um, I wanna keep this moving. I just wanna bring up this thing that we have, we have at least five, there's, there's many more degrees of freedom for designing um, these photocatalysts that we can exploit. Um, the pH in the reactor is one, the particle shape, This there's strategies to control this um, in synthesis. We can control particle size. Um, we have materials like um, all the ferroic um, perovskites that are all have internal polarization. This is also good for separating charges. And I won't talk about this at all, but um, we can put thin coatings on these particles and that can actually increase the reactivity. Um, but more importantly, it, it can protect the surface. Because a material like strontium titanate, the alkaline earth component of that is e easily leached out into solution. And I know we all think strontium titanate is not soluble in water, right? But leave it in water and sunlight for, for a year. It <laughs> turns out all the, in the top um, uh, 10 nanometers, all the strontium will be gone and you won't have strontium titanate there anymore. Okay, um, so with that, I'm, that was a long introduction. I'm gonna move on to some of the more recent things where we've been doing, and in particular, um, this molten salt reaction. And just to, um, I didn't go into this at the beginning, but one of the things Doman's group um, discovered about 10 years ago was that the way to get strontium titanate, one of the things you need to do to strontium titanate to make it so reactive is you need to give it a bath in molten strontium fluoride, okay? Um, and the, uh, and to, just to give you an idea, these are particles, these are 1% aluminum, 2% aluminum particles that we grew. And if you measure the hydrogen from them in my crude reactor, we can't even measure anything from these particles. Take the same particles, give them this bath I talked about, and now they, they produce a lot of um, hydrogen. And so this is really essential. Um, the aluminum doping is important. The co-catalysts on the surface are important, but without this, it doesn't work or it doesn't work very well. And so um, how do they, it's, how's it reported? Um, you take your catalyst, you put it into an aluminum crucible, you put in some strontium chloride, you heat it up till the chloride melts, and then um, you wash that away and you um, add some co-catalyst at the end, and then you have a good catalyst. Why? 
no one ever seemed to care. And so there's there's probably hundreds of papers published on this and people report this preparation. And um, it's not obvious what, what's going on here. And I wasn't even so interested in it either at the beginning, but I'll tell you why. Um, turns out we, we, I thought it was essential to figure this out. And really what I wanted to do is if this works so well for strontium titanate, why can't I do it to something else? But th that's where the problems came up. So, so the students, students, you guys can, can laugh about the following. Okay? And, and the professors can feel bad like me. But so I don't get to the lab anymore. So here's the professor's vision of what how you do this experiment. Take your aluminum crucible, you put your strontium titanate in the bottom of the crucible, then you put this powder on it. You put it in the furnace and heat it up till the powder melts. You have a liquid, of course, it, it condenses, it's much denser as a liquid. And then you take it out of the furnace, cool it, and then you're gonna have this solid salt and with your with your catalyst here. And strontium chloride is really soluble in water, so you just dissolve it away. And I do know this because 40 years ago, I used to do experiments and, and I did lots of molten salt experiments. So this is my vision of what happened. And um, as my students were showing me results, it became apparent that's not what happens. And I had asked lots of questions, but in fact, when you look at this thing after afterwards, um, there's, there's no strontium chloride left. In fact, the reason I found this out, my students came in and said, I need to, I'm stuck, I need to wait till some more crucibles come in. And I said, okay, you know, and he goes, yeah. It's weird when I do this reaction, the crucible keeps getting thinner each time. And I said, what? <laughs> so um, it turns out that this stuff is reacting both with the air and it's reacting with the crucible. If you scrape off the stuff that forms on the side of the crucible, it's a strontium aluminate ternary phase. Not surprising in, in any way. Um, if you, uh, uh, if, if you then, once this started happening, I said, well, we have to look closer at this. The first thing is, if you just measure the mass of um, the material, you lose about three to 5% of the mass. So this is not an inert process. This is, this is there's a chemical process going on. We figure this, this probably happens within the first hour. There's no salt left after the first hour. This reaction goes to completion. Um, the, I think I have another, yeah, the phase diagram, if you look it up, in air, if there's any water vapor in your air, and in where I live in Pittsburgh, there's plenty of water vapor in our air, um, you, you oxidize the strontium chloride to form strontium oxide plus HCl. So you have HCl in this solution at 1,000 degrees. It, it's very aggressive, obviously. Um, so I said, well, let's, um, let's get rid of the alumina crucible. That's probably the problem. Let's put it in a platinum crucible. If you put in a platinum crucible, you can stabilize the salt, but um, it completely dissolves your strontium titanate. So, um, so this is kind of a match. So this was one of these things in catalysis where people figured out how to do this, but it's kind of, it's kind of crazy when you think about it. It's, um, it's a controlled decomposition reaction is what's going on. So we, we wanted to look at this more carefully. So we took single crystals. And I just want to, this is what, when you have a strontium titanate 110 single crystal, remember this is the anodic one. Um, and you heat it in air, you get your steps on the surface. If you do the um, reduction reaction with silver, you only decorate the edges because that's where these 100 surfaces are. That's, that's the only place it's cathodic on here. If you do the oxidation reaction, I apologize, you can't see it. All of these terraces are covered with manganese hydroxide at this point. And so it's um, very, um, this is the anodic surface. Now, if we put this in that crucible with the um, aggressive um, molten salt, now um, we have a kind of a mess on the surface. These are dislocation etch pits, these big deep holes. You can't see it here. There's very fine steps everywhere on this surface. It becomes now, it will um, react with, it will um, reduce silver. It becomes bifunctional. And it gets, it's very aggressively oxidizing. So the bare, the normal surface was um, anodic. This is way more anodic when we measure the amounts of stuff that deposit on here, it's 10 times better. So the salt treatment has really shifted this um, reactivity of the surface. We do this, we can do similar things on the cathodic surface. Um, the 100 surface is, is bifunctional. It will reduce and oxidize if you just heat it in air. 
but once we put it in the salt, it um, it uh, com it uh, completely um, it suppresses the photo reduction, um, um, but it um, and, but it completely eliminates the photo oxidation. In other words, it was bifunctional before. Once we put it in this salt, we've shut off the oxidation experience. And that's a really key thing because now we can, even though it has decreased the reduction reaction, it's okay that it decreases as long as it can still do it because the reduction is easy. And so, but we've, we've made it impossible to oxidize the material. That, that's what will separate the charges. So, um, with, and again, it, it's hard to see, but what we did next is we use um, Kelvin pro probe force microscopy. So you can measure the surface potential with the Kelvin probe. And um, what we found is that if um, before we did this um, strontium chloride bath, um, we can measure the potential on the surface, that these potentials get much more negative after this treatment. And we did lots of experiments with different salts. I'm not going to um, go, um, over what, you know, get all those details out. But let me just say, this is a unique um, result, that the strontium chloride does something to the surface that, that um, makes it far more negative in charge. And if you, and these are, these are crude experiments, um, but if you do XPS on the surface, and what I mean by crude is, you know, we're doing things in molten salts and air, and then we shove these things into a vacuum chamber, but you can at least assess relative concentrations of hydroxyl groups on the surface. And what we find, um, again, without going into the numbers, is that in this, um, in the strontium chloride um, treated um, material, the concentration of hydroxyl groups almost doubles on the surface. So we're, we're, it's getting more negative by the Kelvin probe and by composition, it seems to be uh, more hydroxylated. And if you, for various samples, if we correlate the points for the um, surface potential and the concentration of hydroxyls, they seem correlated with each other. So this at least establishes some um, reason for this. And so what the strontium chloride um, treatment is doing is it's pushing the potential of these surfaces way down in the negative range. And that what that does is it shuts off the, the um, anodic abilities of the 100 surface, and it promotes the anodic capabilities of the 110 surface. So we, we, we believe that's really what's going on in this process. And a good question is how it happens in this crazy situation when you have strontium chloride and you happen to heat it in aluminum crucible, is there a more sensible way to do this? And I'm not going to go down that path right now, but we have tried a number of things. But I want to talk about um, another set of experiments um, in the last couple of minutes before I wrap up. And I initially told you I was interested in this reaction because I thought, if it's so good for strontium titanate, why can't it, we do it with other things? And so my student did the following experiment. He, um, he, I asked him to take some barium titanate and treat it the same way. And maybe barium titanate will get 10 times better. Um, and it did, it got really good. In fact, so um, the highest that we've ever measured in our lab on this. It took us about two months though to figure out <laughs> it wasn't barium titanate anymore. Once we put it in this salt, it, it completely ion exchanged with the strontium and became just pure strontium titanate. But for some reason, this ion exchange, what I call ion exchange strontium titanate is better than the conventional strontium titanate, but by a factor of two. In fact, the one thing I wanna point you to is this, um, this yellow line or orange line, this is, um, has 10% methanol. If you wanna get the highest reactivity, or the, the highest hydrogen yield about, out of any of these, you add methanol. What this says is that without the methanol, this works just as well. And that is remarkable, at least in my experience of looking at these catalysts. The fact that this thing, um, it, it is able to oxidize water as easily as methanol. And um, in other words, that's not holding it up. The, uh, we, we studied this reaction uh, fairly thoroughly. What you find is that, again, this is impossible even for me to read. Uh, this reaction happens very quickly. This is, the, this is the lattice parameter of pure strontium titanate. So what we did is we put the material in this salt um, for a very short period of time at different temperatures. We pull it back out. And by um, 10 minutes at 1100 degrees, it already has the, the lattice constant of strontium titanate. 
So it converts very quickly. If we measure hydrogen from these, again, as soon as you have the conversion reaction, you get this high hydrogen yield from these. And so there's something that's about this particular um, process that's different. We did a we did an experiment. I'm not gonna. We did an experiment to try to um, see if it was uniform inside, and so chemically. So we used EDS. I'm not gonna interpret these results. They're not that exciting, actually. But the way we had to get these these profiles is we put the these particles in a in a focused ion beam, and we milled off um, half of them, and so then we could measure the composition across it. That was the goal. But what we found is that every time we we cut one open, and I apologize. Can't, you can't see this, but that's why we have the schematic here. There's a hole in the middle of every one of these. And so um, this is, um, the, the other results are that I don't think are, I don't think are important or that there's still about 2% residual barium and there's a, a small amount of chlorine in these also. But there's these holes and that's what really key, at least in um, my field, you know, this is a classic um, Kirkendall diffusion problem that if, if we have barium diffusing out, and strontium diffusing in, if they aren't, assuming they don't just diffuse at the same rate, and there's no reason they ever should, you always have to be left with a void in the, in the more slowly diffusing species. And again, barium is bigger than strontium, I would assume it's going to diffuse more slowly than strontium, especially through the strontium pigment. So having a void in the middle is a sign that there was an um, exchange process going on, and volume couldn't be conserved in that process because of the differential fluxes. It's a very um, well-established problem. So, but I don't think the holes have anything to do with the reactivity either. And we, we did um, analyze that a bit. And then, so the next thing we did is let's take a look at it in TEM. And before I show you my terrible micrograph, um, I'll just apologize that these are, yeah, this is it's just not showing up. These are, um, the way you do a TEM experiment is you, make a great thin foil um, either by a fib or you by exquisite polishing and you have parallel sides and you put it in and you know the crystallography and you make a beautiful image. We have these weird shaped particles. So we have to get them in the TEM and then we have to find one where we can look down through an electron transparent area of the corner. It's, it's a, it, it just, you just have to hunt and seek and they're never ideal. But what we uniformly see, you now the surface is out here. And um, the lattice fringes here are completely consistent, and the diffraction pattern is completely consistent with strontium plate. So there's no, but just below the surface, we always find these different fringes with the with the wrong spacing that shouldn't be there in strontium plate. And um, they're a, a little, they're about, they're approximately twice as wide. And it turns out that these are um, at least consistent with this is like again, these are non ideal experiments, but. These lattice fringes we observe and the diffraction we observe is consistent with the idea that we have a strontium rich phase. It's re referred to as it's the first order um, Ruddleson Popper phase, if people know that. But basically, you have an extra layer of strontium oxide in here. And we believe this makes sense because we're, we're dunking in this strontium rich um, melt that is reacting to form strontium oxide. And, we, and if the strontium can't, um, if there's this exchange of different of barium and strontium with different fluxes, if you build up too much strontium in one area, you can precipitate this phase, and um, this will electrically affect. This will this could, could you can imagine will affect things, and so there are reports in the literature that this phase, adding this phase to um, strontium titanate increases its reactivity, um, and it's uh, there's a number of things that are attributed to this. Um, People attribute it to compensating donors. I don't. I think it's more than that, um, but we're still we're still working on the experiments to to resolve that. So I'm going to finish up here. I think I hopefully didn't go over, um, not yet. Um, but anyway, the, um, the three things I want to leave you with is that um, I think this this new reactor is a kind of tool that will allow like people like me who are material scientists rather rather than a, a, a catalytic chemist to really explore material parameter spaces and try to identify what's important in the catalyst. Um, the the molt, this, this magic molten salt treatment is much more than I think people realize. And there's a lot going on there. I wish we could understand it better so that we could apply it to different materials. And um, 
And this apparently ion exchange um, material seems to be better because of this induced microstructure. And I'll, um, I'll point out that I learned something from Paul the other day in his lecture about mineral replacement. And I, I don't know if there's a difference between mineral replacement and ion exchange, but it seems like um, that's what's um, very similar to what's going on here. What he showed us with the lead carbonate and the calcium carbonate. So if there's time, I'll try to answer any questions if people have them.